It's comics are great. The vi- it's I'm gonna get this intro right yet. You know, it's this episode sixty, and you'd think that I'd be good at this thing by now, but it just it it, sh- it goes to show that uh, no amount of practice will ever get you ready for when your wheels hit the ground. This is comics are great. The visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, on the corner of Fifth and William Comics and this is the show where we talk about making comics, publishing comics getting our comics read by people, uh, what, what goes into being a cartoonist, the cartoonist lifestyle, and all the stuff that goes into celebrating this medium that we love. And my name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today is Aaron Helmrich. Who, Hello. Uh, teen librarian. Teen librarian and IT production is added to the, IT to the hat IT production. Today. Yeah, we got to go into that <laughs> at some point during the discussion yeah. is like the changing roles of librarianship, mm-hmm. right? Um, but yeah, teen librarian and IT production at the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, you are the selector yes. for the graphic novel collection. Yes, yeah? absolutely. We, you know, a lot of bigger libraries have what we call central selectors, and I am the one for all ages for graphic novels. So we have separate collections for kids, teens, and adults. So you're the gatekeeper. Yes. Yeah, and I find that to be a perfect mix because. Particularly with graphic novels, you may see one book come in and go, you know what, let's put that here or there. And having one person handle all of the ages makes that flexibility a lot easier. Mm, mm, yeah, because this is something that's been a hot topic in uh, librarianship for the last, what, how many, five years more, is like where you put these darn yeah. things. And yeah, I, and I will say that the biggest um, challenges, or if you even want to call them that, I just say occasional um, issues we've ever had are more with our staff and shelving things. <laughs> and accidentally shelving certain things in certain collections and that sort of stuff. So, right. like yeah. our crumb in the kids room. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's comics, right. so of course it's a kids book, yeah. right? And then, and then you have like the people who would say like, oh, the, let's put Garfield in the adult mm-hmm. collection because mm-hmm. yeah, because it, comics aren't for kids yeah. anymore. But what my favorite is though, Calvin and Hobbes is the one comic that's in all three collections. Oh wow! Yeah, it's one of the, one of the few. I can't think of maybe Archie, but I think. Calvin and Hobbes is the one that we have in all three areas. So there, there's the evidence that it's truly an all-ages book. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I want to say to the folks who are watching live, and this is why you should watch the show live every we- every other Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, is this is your chance. If you're a cartoonist, if you want, have questions for a librarian on how to get your uh, comics into a library collection. Now, this might be considered a follow-up episode to uh, episode 31, where I had Sharon Iverson on, where we talked about this. The episode was called Know Your Selector. And we unfortunately didn't have you for that discussion. So this is the chance to really talk to a selector and find out how to do this thing. Because, you know, to this day, I still get uh, questions from people knowing that I work extensively with uh, places like the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, Well, how do you get your books in there? Mm -hmm. Uh, Just go up to a circulation clerk and just hand it to them. And you're like, oh, no, no, that's not how it works. Not if you don't want it to get lost (laughs) somewhere along the way. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And and not all libraries take donations. No, no. I mean, it's. The hardest thing about it, I have to say, is figuring out what the culture is at your library. Do you have a teeny tiny library where there's maybe one librarian that does a whole bunch of stuff? Is it a bigger system like ours where there's layers of things? So I think talking to somebody in general and kind of getting the lay of the land, you know, in terms of, you know, who does what and kind of how sophisticated a system you're dealing with will make it a little bit easier. So in other words, you're saying you should probably try to start out by forming a relationship with your library Absolutely. than just walking yeah. in cold yeah. and yeah. like, hey, I'm an author. Yeah, ideally you're a user as well mm-hmm. because that's going to make a big difference. You know, mm-hmm. certainly in certain environments, if they know you, they've seen you coming in, it makes it a little bit easier that they didn't just decide to come in today because they wanted something from you, you know. So it's helpful, I think, um, for a long-term relationship if you want to get to know some people, you know, as a user of the library. And, you know, it, I can see somebody already getting their hackles raised about this, saying, like, oh, so you mean I got a schmooze even at a library? But we're talking about building trust here, too, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, that's part of it, is that you're building a relationship to build some sense of trust so that when you approach them with your book, they're like, oh, hey. You know. Well, and keep in mind that libraries get inundated with people that are self-published in all kinds of mediums. So not obviously just graphic novels. And unfortunately, um, I think more so with things that don't include text, you have a poorer product in some cases. So a lot of librarians are already a little bit like, um, you know, because they're just used to having the hard sell with people who, you know, have 
a lower quality book that maybe they couldn't get published through the normal channels. Of course, that's all changing now because mm -hmm. of what's going on with publishing. But um, so I think you do kind of sometimes walk into a preconceived notion. So it helps, you know, if you have that more casual conversation or if nothing else, you just know that they already have a graphic novel collection and you're aware of, you know, how things work a little bit. I think that helps a lot rather than just kind of your cold call. Right. Um, I want to ask, I want to back up in a second, but before you just said something interesting, uh, is, I mean, in your estimation, I mean, you've been going to ALA for many years, you're deeply involved in yeah. the library scene. I mean, you're, you're on the Prince Committee, yeah. you know? So, I mean, just real quick, what's the Prince Committee? Um, well, everyone hopefully knows about Caldecott and Newberry for best illustrations and best literature for kids. Prince is for teen books. So yeah. it's the best book that's published every year for teens. And Yalsa is, is it a subcommittee of Prince or is yeah. Prince a subcommittee of Yalsa? Um, I forget. The, yeah, ALA is complicated with all its acronyms. <laughs> there's ALA and then there's the divisions. And so there's the kids division, which has a long, complicated name that does Newberry and Caldecott. Yalsa does Prince. Oh, okay. But it's okay. still all the under the ALA umbrella. Okay. But so anyway, so you, th this is all to say that you are in deeply ingrained into your, your, uh, your scene. Absolutely. And so in your estimation, has the uh, attitude towards self-publishing changed at all in the last It's definitely years? changed. I, I'd say even more so just in the last two to five years because of the nature of how, you know, now Amazon is a publisher. So you can come up with a lot more sophisticated product mm -hmm. than you used to be able to. Um, ebooks is changing everything. Some folks go straight to ebooks now instead of even attempting to do print. Mm -hmm. um, so there is definitely a little bit of prejudice about self-publishing in general still just because We've seen a lot of sad books out there that folks have put together over the years. Books, you know, books where people didn't uh, avail themselves of an editor or right, something like that. Right, yeah. and you know, and just you know, sad illustrations. You can just, unfortunately, you can tell. One thing that's been put through a committee with you know publishers' money and all that sort of thing to market something and make the cover look real slick. A mm -hmm. lot of times, self pub stands out really easily. So, um, but that's changing. I mean, it definitely is changing, and and changing more so. The bigger your library system, the more sophisticated the folks are going to be. Smaller, remote, you know, single libraries, things are different. It's kind of like a time warp in some cases. In some cases, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just kind of, you're dealing with all kinds of different levels of, right. you know, what that, also funding is a huge issue. I mean, keep oh, in yeah. mind, um, most libraries out there have been really hurting in the last four years, and, and it's going to continue for them because the tax stuff is still kind of rolling out. So that's kind of the toughest issue that most folks are going to deal with is just, you know, how hard up is that library and, you know, who's doing what and, you mm -hmm. know. Well, and we've got listeners, or rather viewers, watching right now from uh, from Europe and, and beyond, and uh, I'm sure that the library system is different in, in other countries. We're talking yeah. primarily about, you know, United, United States. United States. United and States and public libraries specifically, because that's yeah. an important thing to note. I mean, a school library, you know, an elementary K-12 to Totally different academic libraries for universities, very different. So, and and I want to I want to also underline something else that you said there that I think is really interesting is this thing about different libraries having diff different cultures. Uh, last year, and I know I've told the story before, I visited twenty three different libraries around the state of Mich just Michigan, uh, to promote the Kids Read Comics celebration that we do every year. And oh boy, oh boy, I mean. Even remote rural libraries are very different because some of them you right. have uh, the the culture of oh, graphic novels. Mm -hmm. We want our kids to read real books. And then you have other ones where there's you know this kind of young hip attitude exactly. of graphic novels are awesome. Too bad we don't have a budget to order as many as we would yeah. like. I mean, right? and I think uh, sadly on one level it can come down to one or two people in an organization. I mean, you mm -hmm. may, I mean, in many cases the director is the most important in some cases because they set the tone. But all you need is one enthusiastic librarian on staff who's gotten on board, and um, and it can change everything, especially when we're talking about graphic novels. So, okay, you said some interesting stuff here about the different cultures and about uh, you know getting to know the library and getting to know what the, what their budgets are like. Um, I want to back up a second now. People who are watching by now. I'm sure already signed on to this idea that they want their comics in a library. Yeah. But just in case, you know, maybe if they're on the fence or if they're like, uh, eh, I guess that's one more place to get my books read. Um, I want to throw the devil's advocate question at you. And as somebody who manages this collection, you know, oh, that's great. I got my comic in a library and now I made one sale. Yeah. whoop dee doodle do. Yeah. You know, why would I want to do that? What's the value of, of having your book in a uh, public library collection? I think... You know, 
the amount of people that might put their hands on that one copy mm -hmm. can be through the roof, especially, you know, if even in a smaller library, they have a smaller collection. Therefore, your book is going to stand out a lot more next to bigger, you know, publisher titles. You know, if you're going up against Marvel and DC and maybe that's where the library is spending a lot of their money. Mm -hmm. um, so that kid, you know, you never underestimate the obsessive, you know, dedicated fan quality that a, um, well, anyone, any age can have, but particularly when you grab kids and teens at a certain age, um, if they lock onto your book, um, for example, I'm a huge, um, I'm always recommending the Bumper Boy books, mm -hmm. and I wish that she would write more because I know there's some kids who would, you know, be all over it, so... Um, you're getting exposure every single time that book goes home. You've got a parent. I think that there's obviously the potential for purchasing them. I mean, mm. you know, people, you know, a lot of people use libraries to test things out. You know, let's see what's, you know, what my kid is into. Is this something they're interested in? And then we get a lot of questions sometimes from grandparents and relatives who will call the library and say, hey, do you recommend some books that I can buy for Christmas or yeah. birthdays and things like that? So, you know, if you forge that relationship and the stuff is in there and the librarian who's selecting gets that question, they're going to recommend your books. And, and there's certainly a lot more, um, there's folks that will be more loyal to an independent person and want to recommend their book highly, especially if they love it, um, compared to just recommending superheroes and things that are already really established. Right, right. So could you just give me like a, a sense of, I mean, now AADL has a unique uh, patronage in yes. the sense of the very, very active card holders here. Yeah. Uh, but like, the, what, what would be like a high circ number on a graphic novel? Oh my like, goodness. A, like a ballpark. Um, well, for some libraries getting, you know, 10 to 20 in a year, we can see anywhere from 50 to 100 circs for one copy of a book okay. in a given year. Um, and then, you know, obviously when you do have a generous budget and you buy five copies, you're looking at, you know, anywhere from 30 to 80 circs per um, book, you know, per, you know, issue that you've got. So you multiply it obviously by how many more you have. But even in a smaller library or, you know, in a standalone, and actually I should say they may end up having way more circulation because if they have a smaller collection, you know, more stuff they can't is going replace on. It as quickly yeah, too. so right. I think hundreds is is an easy. You know, if you're looking at a book that's been well bound and is going to last, right. you know, through all of the attention and love that it's going to be getting. Because how long before, yeah, those pages start falling yeah. out after that many searches? Because like most trade paperbacks are not made to withstand that yeah. kind of yeah. love, right? So yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. Binding is important. If you <laughs> if you want it to last in a library for a while and have it be, um, you know, around. Um, well-bound books are going to last a little bit longer. So would you recommend that some cartoonists, I mean, there are print-on-demand publishers now who can do uh, hardcover binding. Do you recommend that people look into Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that if if you are wanting to make your product more attractive and you're looking, you're going to libraries where they're really having to make some hard choices mm -hmm. in terms of what they're buying, they're going to buy the one that, you know, lasts. Sadly, you know, when graphic novels first started coming into libraries, which was like the mid to late 90s was the very, very beginning, um, there was definitely a few publishers out there who had really poor binding and the word kind of spread. So people mm. would stop buying certain things. Um, you know, glossier paper with trades tends to fall apart the oh, easiest. Oh, well, especially with the way that some of those trades are made nowadays where they don't do the actual wraparound stitch exactly. binding. They just yeah. glue them to the yeah. the, bind, the binding strip there. And yeah, like some of like those little cinemangas, I mm -hmm. noticed those would fall apart like those crazy. Those are one of the worst culprits, yeah. 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 And so when you're dealing with that, I mean, obviously a library who is watching their pennies is going to want to make sure that it's going to last. So, yeah, I mean, if if that's an option and it's easy enough to do print-on-demand with a harder cover, then I think your odds are a little bit stronger. See, you see, everybody, so you, you, you bring in a library <laughs> and they'll even give you printing <laughs> advice. <laughs> this is why you should form a relationship yes. with your library, for crying out loud. Yep. So I want to remind people in the chat that if you have any questions for Aaron, now is the time to ask him. Go ahead and type them in. I'll keep my eye on the chat. And Eric Closter will be there to ping me and also nudge me that, uh, you, that you guys... Uh, have something interesting to contribute to this thing. But, um, okay, so I want to get at something else. I mean, now this is a taste thing. This is an opinion thing. And uh, I know that, um, you know, you can't speak for every librarian, but maybe you can give us like a sense of when you're selecting a book, 
you know, uh, I, I had this, I'll, I'll frame this up with an anecdote. So I had the first printing of my graphic novel, The Front Rebirth, with 14 characters on the cover all running at each other. It was this very chaotic thing because I'm a big fan of guys like George Perez who, like, put a million characters in the covers. As it, When I was eight years old, that was really, really exciting mm-hmm. to me. I took this book to shows. I would sell maybe, like, two books at a convention. And uh, some friends twisted my arm and said, no, you need the, the cover to have more focus, to be simpler and easier to understand what, it, what, what the expectations are of this book, you know, the judging a book by its cover okay. thing. And so then I did a new version, and I printed it uh, more manga-sized, and I did it with, uh, I focused the design on Jared the Abominable Snowman, who was a very, you know, recognizable face, very iconic-looking face, and I noticed that sales quadrupled more than that you know it was i started selling a lot more at, co- at comic conventions because the cover in i guess something about the simpler design invited people to look more now i'm wondering now I'm not just talking about covers but um when a cartoonist is thinking about whether or not they should take their work to a library what are librarians or you what are you looking for like how are you evaluating because i mean this is this is a big thing this is like yeah. reader's advisory this is also like you, you look, you're looking in trade magazines or not trade magazines what would you call those magazines like the review journals review and journals things like that and and a lot of blogs now too but also when a, when a comic passes under your nose i mean how because you're you're selecting for everybody it can't just be limited to just well this mm-hmm. is my taste so i'm just gonna get it yeah yeah <laughs> this is the Aaron helbert yeah. collection ADL. Yeah. So I mean, what 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 kind? How do you could you describe what your judgment pattern is like or judgment system is like? Well, I will say that one of the challenges a lot of people had when we first started adding graphic novels to libraries, and it definitely kind of started from teen librarians specifically, is it, it's great to have an adult collection because you wanted to buy some of those cornerstone titles and you couldn't buy them and put them in a teen collection, or or you shouldn't if you're you know kind of trying something new. So. Depends on who your audience is. If you're if you're selling for kids and teens, um, you know, to some extent, anything under about ten or eleven, lots of guns on the cover, and you know, the more sexy protagonists that you might have um, are going to limit you. You know, mm-hmm. in terms of who your audience is. But I I buy so much based on patron recommendations and things that people want. And, you know, have a desire for that I don't even, to be honest, find myself limiting too much. I mean, I buy based on reviews. I buy based on, you know, at this point, lots of authors have, you know, reputations. They've been publishing. Um, You know, they've got a base. They've got a storytelling audience. And so covers, they come into play, really, they really come into play more so with the youth materials. So you have to be a little bit more careful with what you put into the kids department not because we're worried about censorship or content or anything but because it's a visual medium it's just so much easier for parents and caregivers to react to something if they see it in an illustration as opposed to something in text Mm -hmm. so I think that tends to be where the bigger scrutiny is with the teen collections and with the adult collections I don't think it matters quite as much, you know, and on one level, I mean, I can hear what they're saying about having a more simplified cover, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, there's lots of things that have complicated covers that, you know, <laughs> I don't understand what's going on and I'm like, but I know that there's somebody that's going to want this and, and they're going to read it and, and whatnot. So I think it's, it's more of an issue when you're talking about kid stuff and really only maybe with graphic novels. I mean, right. you know, it's just a different you know, medium, and, and it's it's interesting how people react more strongly to it. Same with picture books, you know, picture story books, of course, Same with too. video. I mean, yeah. like if you, what, what's what's that uh, that uh, uh, romance novel that's really pop, Fifty Shades of Grey yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Like, if that's made into a movie... Exactly. Or if that was turned into a graphic novel, which, let's be right. honest, could happen. Right. Um, you know, like Lost Girls was, was one particular title oh, that we yeah. had some challenge... You know, we... We did end up buying it, and then we did end up not putting it on the shelf. And I had actually told, you know, I sort of said, I'm like, I don't know, you know, if we want to do this one. And, you know, it's a beautiful book, but because of some of the subject matter, and I think more so because of incest and, you know, weird sort of things that are illegal, Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of your thresholds as well, (laughs) is um, (laughs) are there legal or illegal things occurring on your cover? Um, You know, those are the sorts of things that we have to (laughs) to consider. Um, Yeah, that is true. You know, and and, and it's like, I I, uh, sort of define myself as an all ages or kids comics kind of guy, but my graphic novel, The Front, has a lot of gunplay in it. And so when I thought about that, it's like, even though all the, the violence is very cartoony, Mm-hmm. It's still violence, 
and it's still stuff exploding left and right. So I would, whenever I'm talking with librarians about my book, I say, well, this is really a preteen, teen book. Mm -hmm. This is not a youth book. Because youth yeah. book, we're talking, what, second, third grade, somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, we're really talking all the way up to about fifth grade. But you kind of keep the younger ones in mind for right. the entire range because they're all shelved together. And your kid that's coming up there for, you know, a simple Pokemon book is going to be looking at the full collection as well. So, but the collection itself is pretty much from preschool all the way to about 10 or 11. So it's not that you're judging by content in terms of, oh, well, this has, uh, you know, uh, demons in it. This has guns in it. No, I, we can't carry it. All. It's a situation where it's like, well, we just have to shelve it appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just kind of want to make sure that, I mean, because the interesting thing is when libraries first started embracing and, and, and people were fighting to get graphic novels in there, like I said, the adult collection was the hardest one because in a lot of libraries, you've got your bureaucracy and you had to have an adult librarian who wanted to have that collection. Mm. And you couldn't have the teen librarian buying for adult. I mean, you know, it's not always that case, but that's the kind of stuff you're up against. So if you didn't have an adult librarian who was willing to sign on, then, you know. And so, you know, at the beginning of the publishing boom in this era there a lot of the really mainstay stuff was adult stuff mm -hmm. and um a lot of libraries kind of struggled or they, i think some put them in teen and you know maybe regretted it later on but um having that freedom to have that adult collection is awesome because mm -hmm. it's for adults you know yeah. anything goes and i tend to put manga and other things that are geared towards like 16 and 17 up in the adult collection only because I know that that's probably where that 16 and 17 year old is going to find more stuff that they're interested in anyway. So it just kind of goes together. Yeah, you know? I, I can see that. Like when, when you're, uh, who, who's 17 magazine for? It's for 15 year olds, yeah, right? And exactly. so they're going to they're gonna look at the age range above them. Oh, yeah. that, that's some interesting gameplay well, that you got to deal with. And this, ma manga in particular, it tends to have those challenges because yeah. there's so much fan service in there and you have a lot of the, you know, Kids that look like they're 10 or 12, but they're really 22. You know, a lot of those kind of illustration issues um, with the yao, you know, with uh, the, the yaoi, uh, yeah, you know, the, 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 the boy romance yeah. kind of stuff. Right. And, you know, it's it's all great. And, and in fact, the covers are usually you can't tell what's going on, which <laughs> is why it's important to know the content. But that tends to be why, you know, and especially because manga is very good as well for their own protection, they've been so great about putting the ratings on right from the get-go with ages yeah. just to give people guidelines because they knew they were fighting against preconceived notions at the beginning. Oh, and yeah, so they've been the good beginning. about that. Okay, I got a question for you. Um, well, we had a question in the chat. They're asking me where did I get the Transformer poster behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I happen to have some very good friends who look out for me, and when they come across these things, I just get them in the mail. This is this is where my my really really good friends come in. I don't know where that Transformers poster came from, but the Teen Boat poster actually. Uh, if anybody wants to know where to get that, you can go to TeenBoatComics.com or YayTime.com to get that. I think that's equally cool. I mean, it has a when get out of the way it has a boy turning into a boat for crying out loud. That's a, that's the best kind of Transformer. Uh, Demophon, John O'Ballier, who's been on the show before, asks in the chat, how difficult is it for a library to maintain a mini comics or zine catalog, and is it something that we should try to get our local libraries to do? Um, that's definitely tough. That's like a cataloger's nightmare. Yeah. Um, in the sense that now there's libraries out there that do maintain really great collections. A lot of the places that did it first tend to be academic libraries, Right, um, like at the Duderstadt Center here on, at the University of Michigan. Yeah. Uh, Dave Carter has that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, and they were definitely the ones that were, you know, jumping on that bandwagon. Um, I, it all comes down to having a motivated librarian. If somebody wants to make it happen, it can happen. Um, but it does challenge, you know, the back, behind-the-scenes people that are having to either... Uh, maybe a library doesn't have an original cataloger, which, you know, I don't want to get into Mark Records and all that nightmare. But, <laughs> you know, there's... There's people who can do that stuff, and some mm. folks import a lot of that data, so it's a little bit harder. If, they do, if the library doesn't have the staff to do the detailed, um, you know, keep in mind, libraries, you know, we're used to doing things the way that we do them, and so we have to do a thorough cataloging on a tiny little material. This is something you know? that, see, I'm married to a librarian, <laughs> so I know this, but, but uh, I, a lot of cartoonists may not be aware yeah. of... When you turn in the book, you can't just put a sticker on it no. and put it on the shelf because how the heck are you going to find it? Yeah. This thing needs to be cataloged. And yep. you, you mentioned Mark Records. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of fields to fill yeah, out. Yeah, Library of Congress. I mean, there's all of these overriding things. Now, 
That being said, a library that just wants to get this going and maybe doesn't care if those items are findable or if they go missing, but they just want to provide a collection, there's shortcuts around it. I mean, you can kind of do a more on-the-fly collection that's going to be not as cataloged and it's not going to show up in the, you know, OCLC, you know, all of these places, um, but it'll still be on the shelf. And if that's what you want to do, that's doable, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, there were zines have kind of gone through, you know, a flux. There was a period of time when they were definitely more popular in a lot of libraries as like a place to go to try something new. And so a lot of places had zines. Um, I don't hear about them quite as much in the library community now. I mean, I think, I think a lot of people think a lot of that stuff has shifted online, which maybe it hasn't all, you know, but mm -hmm. I think there's that perception as well. Um, so it's, it depends on finding the right person. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of finding the right person, and I, I also want to like sort of put a sidebar underscore thing next to this thing about uh, the behind the scenes stuff is we said at the top that you are a teen librarian and in IT production now. Yes. And I hinted that we were going to talk about this, yeah. uh, this how the, the changing face of librarianship means that you guys are taking on an awful lot. You guys got to be uh, web content creators. You have to be marketers now, mm -hmm. as well as catalogers, as well as selectors, as well as providing readers advisory, public desk assistance, answering reference questions. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at here is you guys got a lot on your plate. Yeah. So that's something to bear in mind when you're making a relationship with this librarian and saying like, hey, I want to start a thing. I Absolutely. Wanna, you know, it's like, bear in mind that things may start slowly. But that said, I want to back up and I want to ask, um, devil's advocate kind of thing. I'm a cartoonist. I'm in, you know, like central Michigan. I'm in like the Clare area, right? Mm -hmm. Small library, rural library, uh, beleaguered selector. And I go up to them and I want to start forging a relationship with them. And they've maybe got a couple mangas in the collection. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm trying to sell them on why they should have a, a wider collection. You'll get more kids. Libraries want kids mm -hmm. in them. Mm -hmm. uh, they want kids to avail themselves of the collections, I should say. Uh, how would you recommend that I, the cartoonist, engage with this person and educate them. Is there any advice that you'd give to a cartoonist on how to educate? Because, I, I mean, I was at ELA two years ago, and I sat in on Robin Brenner's fantastic panel mm -hmm. on how comics work, and there was like, I don't know, two, three hundred people in the audience. And it quickly became apparent that not a lot of librarians there understood really how to shelve comics, where to right. catalog them, even what they are. I mean, how, how to identify a good one from a mm -hmm. bad one. And I mean, thank goodness for people like Robin Brenner and, and folks like you yeah. and uh, who, who do this kind of advocacy on, on our people's behalf. So, you know, in, in uh, if, without having an Aaron Helmrich or yeah. Robin Brenner, how would I, the cartoonist, reach out to a librarian in a smaller area or more remote area to educate them on this? I think, you know, it all, it all depends. It completely depends on your approach. Um, you don't want to go in with the hipster attitude that you know all of this secret stuff that they don't know about. Because, you know, you might be dealing with somebody that's already a little bit insecure about the fact that they aren't doing X, Y, and Z because of their staff limitations and their budgets. Yeah. So they might be feeling a little bit defensive because they know that there's things that other libraries are doing and they're not doing. Um, but I think the way to go about it is A, be as, you know, friendly as you possibly can be, but then sit down and say, you know, maybe there's... I know you don't have a big budget, but maybe we can focus in these areas, you know, because not everyone's going to be able to have a collection that has all the core titles in it that goes back and, you know, puts in things. So, you know, it's a small library. Hey, do we want to start with maybe just some superhero stuff or do you want to do TV tie in? But I think having that sort of lay of the land conversation with them in terms of you know, that there's all of these different types of comics, especially if they don't have a clue. I mean, even as someone who selects, I still find, you know, keeping track of all of the superhero, you know, between manga and superheroes in particular. Oh, yeah. It's a nightmare. I mean, especially <laughs> when yeah. the one that kills me is where there'll be like, you know, nine volumes in one particular series. But for some reason, they didn't publish volume seven as a standalone because it happens to be included in this compilation that was published by, a, you know. So <laughs> you're you're already dealing with a really steep learning curve. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where you don't want to overwhelm them and say, "Hey, there's all of this stuff and you could you know say, let's start small, you know, maybe we want to just focus on 
local regional folks, or maybe we just want to start with, you know, this age group, you know, we don't have a huge budget, so let's focus on those like fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, you know, mm -hmm. um, the ones that are the more, you know, harder to engage in yeah. reading. Asking you know. them what is the target audience that yes. you want to bring in here and Absolutely. then helping them find the corresponding And I think, and if that's all you focus on to begin with, that's still a success. Yeah. I mean, if you're you're looking to reach a certain population and they're not coming in, this is one of the easiest ways, which is why libraries embrace it. I mean, the people, you know, going back all the way to 1999 is when there's... Um, graphic novels and libraries, GNLIB was a listserv that was started by um, Steve Miller. And it's interesting because when it first started, it was a lot of like hand wringing and, and back and forth. Where can I shelve this? What should I put this under? Does anyone have schematics? Now that, it li that they're really involved, the traffic on that listserv, I mean, besides the fact that it's a listserv and, you know, things are changing, but is so much lower because people have gotten it figured out. So many libraries have collections now and they have resources like other librarians. There are librarians that have written books. Mm -hmm. um, the Eisner Awards have now had a librarian as one of their judges for yeah. at least the last six or seven years that I'm aware of. Um, Kat Can was the name of one librarian who has been very involved. Oh, she yeah. was on one of their judges in 05. So... It's interesting how that traffic has changed. So it has exploded so much that I think if you're trying to start small, it's better to kind of target and focus on, you know, who is it that they're wanting to serve and and how can you help them out with that? And I think going in with that approach that um, you might even be an assistant to them to, you know, help them buy. I mean, a lot of places, the best thing that you can do is, you know, if a library, it's the opposite and the library is trying to start it and they don't know where to go, you go to your comic shop. You know, you go to the person who has all of that knowledge, who can tell you, you know what, okay, you only have this much money and you want to start with this population, let's go with this, you know, route. And I think, the po you know, if there's a comic store in the area and the cartoonist wants to approach them, you know, kind of maybe forging that relationship first, you know, before going to the library and helps a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any chance of donations or you know, different events that you might do in conjunction, you know, you, you with anticipated, the store, you, you know? anticipated my, the next area where I wanted to go, because this is something we talked about with Sharon Iverson, but I want to get your perspective on this is like, how much would it affect that relationship building and that collection building if the cartoonists were to volunteer to do some kind of majorly? Event? Yeah. I mean, because with young kids, I mean, you know, one of the greatest things about programs in general is that you can have this really specific lightning focused topic and then you have a kid or a teen or wh whoever an adult who's really into that and they get to come and they get to be all obsessed with it and focused and then they get to focus on the teacher mm -hmm. the person who came there and shared all this knowledge and then they get their you know fanboy fangirl mode in and then whatever they might recommend you know talking about the collection or all of those sorts of things but events completely drive um, mm -hmm. people's interests without even having to do a really hard sell. I mean, you don't have to go up there and do book talking even necessarily. Just yeah. having that, you know, relationship started and then having them feeling comfortable and trusting. I mean, that's the other part is that, you know, having those events lets your attendees trust the library in different ways. Even if it's like not through a library employee, but somebody that the library hired to come and do a program, all of a sudden they go, oh, they actually know what I'm interested in. They care, mm -hmm. and they offered this, you know. And it it definitely starts them kind of branching out and looking at whatever what other stuff the library is doing. Mm -hmm. um, but so events will definitely, um, you know, get that kind of fire going and get people a lot more interested. I mean, we can say that obviously here. Sure, sure. You know? I mean, yeah. And I want to get to when we talk about KRC a little bit and do uh, some thoughts on that as well. But. Um, what I've noticed at other libraries where I've uh, visited is it'll, especially at the more remote ones where maybe their graphic novel collection isn't being as used as heavily, is they'll use that as an opportunity to roll out a book cart. Absolutely, yeah. Right. It's so, like I do my thing, I teach my class, and the mm -hmm. kids get excited about comics, and like, and then then here comes the librarian with this huge book cart. Like, well, here's a whole bunch of stuff you can check out today. And the benefit of it being, hey, you guys, because you came to this program, you have first dibs on all these new yeah. comics or new whatever that just yeah. came in. Um, you can also as underestimate the power of programming for more remote locations. Wherever you have kids who don't have as much going on, Ann Arbor's actually a tougher community. <laughs> because actually, it is. <laughs> there's 9 million bazillion things for kids to do in this community, and right. that's awesome. Um, but certain things 
that fly other places don't fly here. I mean, it's just a different situation. So if you, you know, have a lot less competing for the attention of the kids, then your events are going to be even that more, you know, focused, especially if you tried new things and are, you know, trying to reach new people. Right. And and then then the the question that I got, we did a, a panel at ALA. Um, I was on a panel anyway uh, about this very topic about you starting up programming programming in libraries. And one of the big questions I got from librarians is, how do you find cartoonists? Um, now this is where I say to the listeners out there, the cartoonist listeners and viewers, is like that's where you guys come in is reach out to your local library because they don't necessarily know that you're there. Uh, but I'm wondering, like, if you have any advice for if there are any librarians listening or watching, like, how would you go about finding these people? Because well, all I said at ALA was like, well, go on Twitter, put yeah. a hashtag for your your yeah. local community. So like hashtag Ann Arbor, hashtag comics. Hey, any cartoonists interested in doing some stuff at our library? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, again, you go, you know, if your community is big enough that you have a comic book store. I would imagine that they're going to be the ones that know all the local creators that live in the area or at least have a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, there's that one um, source that I know I pointed you and Ann to, and now I'm not remembering it, but it was somebody who's been actually trying to keep like a master list oh, of, teaching of artists? every you know cartoonist and kind of arranged by region. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not remembering what... It, I mean, Google is your friend in this case. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing is librarians you know, using enough search terms and especially with more folks having websites, you know, I mean, everyone's got their own website or should, or at least have something. Mm -hmm. But I think your suggestion about Twitter is absolutely, you know, on target. I think using social media is a must in certain cases because, you know, you're reaching folks that are marketing themselves in those ways. Um, yeah, really. I mean, what the, the, just about every cartoonist is on one of those networks trying to promote their work. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. And I think talking, talk, you know, if you know of artists in other parts of the country, shoot them an email and say, hey, you know, I know you, you know, not that everyone knows everyone, but you, you know, there's a network there as well, just like with any group. And they might be able to go, you know what, I know X, Y, and Z, and they're in Michigan, and no, 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 no. So I think, you know, using that network as well is one way, you know, to go about it. Kind of, you know, shooting out as much as you possibly can. Because after looking at that list, is there a part of the country where there isn't somebody? I mean, no, I we're mean, under every you're rock. Everywhere. So, I mean, I was even just amazed, you know, with Michigan, how many were just yeah. here. So, yeah, you know, that's funny. I mean, like, I, I grew up in Michigan, yet I didn't realize how what how many cartoonists there were here until uh, until I moved away and then moved back. Yeah, and when I came back, and I was like, oh, I gotta go back to you know. Uh, BFE, uh, yeah. Michigan, and I'm like, oh wait, there's like a vibrant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, active community here. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, okay, well, I, I want to talk a little bit about KRC in a second, but I want to field this question from Joe Fu. It got plus one in the chat by <laughs> Lee Shirolis, and other both Joe and Lee have been on the show. Is that all who's watching this show? Just people who have been <laughs> on it before. Uh, although I'm I'm happy that you're here. I'm thrilled that you guys are here. Uh, but uh, okay, he Joe Fu of uh, Desmond'sComic.com wants to know: Can you comment on what are the most popular graphic novels that are being checked out from ADL right now? Are there particular books that are in demand? Yes. Um, at the top of my head, I'm going to start with adult stuff because that tends to be the ones that have the longest wait lists. So Walking Dead, you know, anything that has like TV tie-in stuff. Um, Archie still circulates pretty decently here, surprisingly, and they keep publishing stuff and they're Archie's keeping up with the times. Really cool stuff, you know? yeah. yeah. Um, boy. Avatar, the uh. new Avatar stuff. Um, Pokemon still goes, you know, I mean... Actually, Garfield is still, I can't buy enough Garfield. <laughs> we probably own 25 to 30 copies system-wide of every single Garfield book that's out there. And there's a lot of them. I think he's yeah. on his, like, 57th compilation. Yeah. Um, I have to keep reordering Calvin and Hobbes. Um, Ann Arbor was an unusual community. We were all over um, Tintin and Asterix before a lot of people were just because we have so many international patrons mm. people that are reading comics all over the world so they request different things um they're still incredibly popular with the adults um manga's definitely gone you know it's is on, it dipped it's dipped definitely i mean compared to when we first started the collection which i'm trying to think now is probably oh four maybe okay. um Manga was a huge chunk of it, and it still is in terms of shelf space. But we're not seeing the, the Cirque that we used to have. It definitely dipped, and, and and definitely dipped with teens, which was their sweet spot um, audience anyway. 
Um, so there's definite, there's a lot more of the, um, well, even something like Feynman by Jim Ottaviani. That, obviously, because it's a local creator, but nevertheless, really enjoying the more hardcore, scientific, informational, the, the memoir stuff, Alison Bechtel's new book, um, mm-hmm. Are You My Mother? You know, that mm-hmm. had a really long hold list. So those tend to be, you know, the ones. Um, we actually have Star Wars Reads Day coming up. They just announced, I think it's October 8th, and um, it's a new deal that all these publishers have gotten together and we're going to be doing a whole day of stuff in October to mm. celebrate. And they have tons of comics and graphic novels. Yeah. So I've been beefing those up in preparation. So what you're saying is, is as one might expect, uh, movie tie-ins, TV tie-ins, or well-established comic strips like Calvin and Hobbes yeah. and Garfield. Yeah, the Garfield thing surprises me too. And I, and I see, uh, you know... Uh, 10-year-olds, 9-year-olds in my comics classes, I asked them uh, to bring in books to talk about. And a lot of them still bring in Garfield. Well, Uh, I mean, I was obsessed with Garfield when I was in third grade. I mean, I really wasn't prepared. I was there too. To to still be having to... I mean, I I just... It's funny to me because (laughs) I was obsessed with the lasagna and the eating the ferns and Odie and all that. And... You know, nothing has changed, and, and we and still love him. A lot of cartoonists report that Garfield is the the comic strip that made them want to make comics. So, I mean, we can't deny its importance yeah. culturally. Yeah. Whatever you have to say about yeah. the comic itself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Dave Dave Carter's in the chat too. He says every kid goes through a Garfield phase. Yeah, I think it's like it's like uh, you know, girls and ponies, right? Uh, and and, bo- well, and boys and, and guns. He's surly, and you know, I mean, they like any anti-establishment figures, and Garfield definitely falls you know, <laughs> into that. In in the kids world you yeah know? <laughs> yeah 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 it is it's like oh Odie's dumb I hate well and, and yeah and, his, and, and the fact that he has a dumb owner yeah you know, it's like I have a dumb parent dumb owner yeah you know, I can totally see there. that uh, but D- Dave reads uh, Dave Dave Carter rather in the uh, chat is is actually posted a link to um, and this is in the the live stream chat uh, a link to AEDL's hot graphic novels yes so we'll put that in the show notes absolutely yeah we have new and hot and hot is based on holds Okay. And and circs and all that sort of stuff. It's cool so, that you guys publish that data. That's it's just... awesome, actually. It's a great tool for me. Yeah. Because I'm able to kind of go, okay, be- even before, you know, there's too many holds or too many people are waiting for something, I can go, oh, okay, people are into that again or, you know, have rediscovered it. And it's a, it's a good tool for us mm. internally to order more things or add, you know, in different areas. So there you go, cartoonists. There'd be a good thing to keep your eye on. Uh, be able to sample from the data of a library that has a very yeah. active constituency, right? That is so awesome that you guys do that. Well, and even the new books. I mean, we have the new, I mean, our hardcore users, they just troll the new graphic novel list and you know we get those covers up right away and that's how that's how a lot of things don't end up making it to the shelf because <laughs> they've put holds on them as <laughs> soon as they they show up in the catalog and they and they go out so we we got to get the book recommendations in a second here but I want to talk about kids read comics cuz this is a big thing that that AADL took on this year and AADL keeps doing all these ambitious things you guys partner with Summerfest you mentioned the Star Wars Reads Day that you're going to be doing yep. in October um, I mean the Lego contest that you yes. do every year which is coming up which is next soon. week yeah yeah next week it's huge mm-hmm. I mean you guys outgrew how many venues um <laughs> Like three, so we're at another <laughs> hotel, and let's hope it can hold us for a few years anyway. It is it is outrageous how how big the stuff that you guys are taking on, uh, and so you know, uh, b- b- bypassing the whole like libraries community center discussion. Yeah. Uh, why uh, this is for cartoonists and librarians who may be listening, and you know we've talked about like forging a relationship with your library, uh, getting involved, maybe doing some events for them. Um, Kids Read Comics is sort of like a growth uh, that came... Uh, growth, man. I make it sound like a tumor. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it grew out of uh, like a relationship that we had been building together mm-hmm. for the past what, six years, yeah. I guess. I've been doing stuff with you guys. Um, and so is this something that... like why, why is it important that libraries do things like Kids Read Comics? Well, I think... I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that it's it really is librarians in a lot of cases that sort of fueled you know, this huge resurgence in, well, I'm not going to call it resurgence, just surgence of, you know, more publishing, more audiences. I mean, it's it's multifaceted, but you go back to this listserv that people, you know, libraries were the ones that were championing and, you know, wanting them to get in there. So notwithstanding, you know, the more, you know, remote, maybe they're not as, you know, cutting edge. You've got a lot of people in a lot of libraries all over this country 
that are dying to do more with this collection. So if they can forge a relationship with someone local and then turn it into... I mean, because one of the reasons kids read comics, I think, is so successful is because we've done the, like, slow burn of audience building Mm -hmm. with all of the, you know, forums and the classes that we've been teaching. And, you know, I think we've been... You get a reputation that people go... These are good quality programs. Mm -hmm. They do a good job. And the fact that that people of all ages can come and get like a six week intensive experience where they're getting, you know, learning new things they're learning new techniques. And then they're also getting good feedback. They're Mm -hmm. getting, you know, I mean, that's a big piece is that, you know, it was so exciting to see all of these kids who are artists themselves or want to become artists have an opportunity to see people who are making a living at it or some form of a living, <laughs> um, you know, um, at least I, I from ma- a kid's point of view, they're I married out, they up, have a table. <laughs> I married up in the pay grade, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, that they can follow their dream and then also get, you know, some immediate feedback, you know, yeah. from folks that can be looking at their portfolios. But the big thing with libraries, and, and, you know, we've all kind of known that all of these changes were on the horizon and now they're really on us. We have to remain relevant. We have to remain interesting to our community and you have to follow what their interests are and if this is one way that you're going to get a whole population i mean think of all the people who came to the pro to kids read comics over those two days that probably don't use their own library maybe or Mm -hmm. they didn't even think that something like this could occur in a library i mean we get that a lot with events you know that we do is people will say i didn't even wouldn't even think that a library would do something like this. There are kids taking my uh, six-week course that's going on right now, Comic Book Academy, that are driving 30 miles yeah. to be there. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. and, and the thing is, is that, you know, on one level... The kids aren't driving, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> is on one level, you feel bad that that all libraries can't be like us. And, you know, and, I, and I'll feel bad that that kid lives in a community. But the thing is that a lot of times, they might go back to their library. I mean, we've told them... Go back and say, hey, can we do something like this? Mm -hmm. So who knows how many other things have kind of come where somebody did an awesome, you know, went to some library and had an awesome experience and that maybe it turned into having a little club at their library, you know. But it it turns into other things when people can see what's possible. Exactly. And one of the things that happened at this year's KRC, during this year's KRC, is we got approached by so many other libraries. There were a lot of, there were a lot of other libraries and other youth serving agencies that came up to that welcome table. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and, and they wanted to know how we did it and how we could do something like that. And, and I was getting emails saying, well, can you do this at our library? And to which I say is that why don't you guys, and, and this isn't to be dismissive, like, start your own darn yeah. festival. But no, yeah. but but start your own darn festival. Yeah. You can do this and it's not that hard if you partner with a local cartoonist and you could create something that's actually more suited to the culture exactly. of your library, something that's suited to that, right? Absolutely. Because not every, com- I mean, Every community is different, and what will fly in certain communities won't. Maybe they want to just do, again, focus on one thing and just right. do an afternoon with a this zine topic. Festival. Yeah, exactly. A mini comic zine festival. Maybe you live in an area that would be more supportive of that than because, like, Kids Read Comics is really focused on comics yeah. aimed at kids. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could do something that's more focused for adults. Maybe you could do something that's more focused to horror, right? The horror well, yeah, or if festival. you have a particular, some communities, I mean, like I said, Manga is still big. It just ebbs and flows. But there are some communities that still have a huge hardcore population. And if that's the way that they go and they want to, you know, get involved, and you know, so you definitely want to find out what's going to work in your community more so than just taking something and saying, well, let me just put this over here because it may not necessarily work, but you can pull something off. Yeah, so um, curious. Are, are you said that the GNLIB listserv is not quite as active as it used to be. Is there a better place to go to connect with librarians nowadays? Well, that's still a good place to go because it's kind of a clearinghouse, and those of us that are you know selectors yeah, I, I are still that one. Yeah. are still on there. I just have noticed there's not as much of the hand wringing. You know, it's, okay. a lot of it was in the early years. Big one was trying to convince the the cataloging back end bureaucracy that you cannot shelve these collections in the same way. I mean, yeah. having to fight on whether or not we can put all the Batman books together and that we can shelve by character and and that sometimes we shelve by author because this particular author is, you know, all of those sorts of things. So if you have that flexibility, you know, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier. But um, there was a lot of that kind of stuff was, let me gather information so that I can prove to the people where I work that this is possible. Uh, um, yeah. And that's gone, you know, luckily a lot of places have shown it's possible and it will also swallow the rest of your collection because of 
the circulation. I mean, yeah. considering that we just started this collection in 2004, it's crazy how much space each of them have in our buildings. Actually, I mean, even the yeah. adult collections are enormous. Yeah. You know, because there's so much more coming out with independent and smaller runs, you know, and so mm-hmm. standalone titles for adults in particular that it's it's awesome. I mean, you can come in and have a really nice selection of things. All three collections are huge, really. But right. yeah, they've taken up a lot of real estate and I think people are seeing that you want to focus on what's going to get checked out and used by the people who paid the taxes that bought the materials. That's yeah, there that's you the, go. your number one, <laughs> you know, customer right there. Uh, so John was asking, and we'll take this final question, then we'll move on to book recommendations. How do you think we should approach our libraries when suggesting mini comics or comics festivals? I mean, you hinted at like a slow burn. Yeah, helps, right. I think do a little research, um, figure out what the libraries. I know. <laughs> I don't know if it's Multnomah in Oregon and Portland. There are a couple. I'm pretty sure that Portland might be one of them. That find out what some of the libraries out there are that are already collecting them and doing a good job and sort of, you know, kind of gather some information so that at least if you're going to go in cold and the person, you know, is going to have lots of questions because they will because we're detail-oriented people, um, <laughs> having the more information that you can get, you know, and go, okay, you know, and also not saying, hey, I want it to be as awesome as this other library, but just I did some research and this is how they, you know, maybe even find out how they do process their materials. Mm-hmm. Find out if there's places that do the, you know, the more fly by night and you don't have to worry about the cataloging quite as much. Theft is a big thing with a lot of libraries. Mm. Worrying about it all the time, you yeah. know, and, and obviously depending on your budget, you have to worry about it. Um, lot, some people look at theft as a positive indicator of that you've been buying the right things so you know you have to have an added you know an attitude adjustment about that but that's going to be one of the things that they're possibly going to be asking you and worrying about oh there we go that's a good list of questions to actually bear in mind and then also yeah i I think uh be careful when playing the comparison game yes because i mean you wouldn't want i mean i'm speaking for cartoonists now you wouldn't want somebody to come up to you and say like Boy, you know, I'd love it if you could do a workshop like Scott McCloud because right. he is awesome. And then, like, oh, great. Well, now you've already set that, that bar that yeah. high. If anybody who's ever seen Scott McCloud's talks, right? It's like, now I got to be that good. I don't know if I want to do this anymore, right? So you wouldn't go up to another library and say, boy, you know what? <laughs> you go no. like to Boogers, Montana and say, you know what the New York Public Library is doing? Exactly. It's awesome. You should totally yeah. do that, you know? I, what you want to do is just show that you did your research and that you're also not comparing and say, okay, I know of these libraries and I am not saying that that's what this is what's going to happen here, but just kind of as a lay of the land Um, and that you did your research too. You know, I think, you know, you're going to get a lot further when you have shown that you kind of looked into it and, and you know what libraries, you know, just know the lay of the land with libraries in general. I mean, Mm -hmm. that you know that there's a difference between an academic and a public because that's going to be a huge distinction. I mean, obviously Mm -hmm. an academic library that's buying it for scholarly, you know, and building it up is a totally different animal than mm. in a public library. They, so. they, they preserve their collections yeah. indefinitely, whereas a public library is yeah. used until public it Public libraries are not archives, so, right. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, well, cool. Well, Aaron, man, thank you so much for all this awesome information you were dumping on us You're today. Welcome. I mean, it, 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 are, it, should people just follow AADL.org or AADL on the Twitters if they want? Uh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, that, that's the best place to, to hear you? Yeah, at the moment, I'm yeah. one of the people who follows the feed, so, yeah. yeah. Maybe after summer, I'll get back on Twitter. <laughs> after, the, after the summer game is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because that's one of the things. Being with my new job title, it's been a different summer, doing yeah. a lot more of the game stuff this you're, year. You're, you're running the, the Pinterest for yeah, ABL2, yeah. right? Yeah, so I started the Pinterest page a couple months ago. And, um, you know, the, all the stuff, Facebook and, and Twitter and, you know, what else might come? Flickr. We'll see. We're working on that. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, okay, so those are the places where you can find Aaron, and we'll link to him in the show notes. Uh, so book time. Book time to talk about some books that just are worth reading. Just grabbed a few new things, um, more so just to kind of show what we've got coming up here at our library. Um, like I said, Archie has continued to be incredibly popular. and um, But what's also fun is this is the Archie Americana series. So this is going back into the different decades um, this is from the 70s, and I, they're just fun for the fashion and, you know, seeing either what has or has not changed too much with Archie. But um, <laughs> I like they're always just fun to see, too, what kind of weird cultural things was, you know, their references in the 70s. Um, another one that we've got um, from Image, Chew is an incredibly popular series here when you were asking about things. Yeah. There we go. Um, 
So this is hotly anticipated, so I'm going to be getting it back upstairs to the cataloger so <laughs> that it can make it to the shelf. Magic um, League Chew. Yeah. So yeah is, referring to Big League Chew? I'm not sure. It's about somebody who has something to do with eating food. <laughs> so I haven't actually read them myself. But that, that one is, is, yeah, is it's already holds on it? Show. Yes, yeah, yes. Right. And then just another one as an example of what we were talking about earlier, kind of more heavy duty, you know, nonfiction. This one is a graphic history of the first atomic bomb. So there are a lot of really great science-based graphic novels out there now, and this will be another addition to it. Um, who's it by? Jonathan Fetter Vorm. So let's see some of the art on the inside real quick, because this looks... Uh, okay. So, yeah. So it, this is the story of, uh, what, the Manhattan Project? Yeah. And yeah, and this is interesting because Feynman was sort of, you know, peripherally involved in this, so kind of dovetail for people who were interested in that book that came out in the spring. Um, he was one of the people semi-involved. So it's got that kind of nice, I mean, I'm a big fan of Rick Geary, the real just straight text and, you know, this is the facts, ma'am, sort of storytelling. Okay. And then... And then the last one we got is... is stuck in the Middle. Stuck in the and Middle. I think we've talked about this one before, but yeah. it's worth repeating. Yeah. So here, tell us about Stuck in the Middle. What's well, so great about it? Well, you tell me some more because I admit that I grab things off the shelf. So is this well, a reorder that we got maybe? Not a new Possibly. E Eli brought it on before, okay. and he spoke very highly of it as... Uh, it, Capturing that middle middle school age kind lots of drama, lots of different um, and, yeah, and styles, different styles and people, which is a nice. I like these are great formats, especially for people who are not normally comics reader and they're not really sure what style they like, or you know maybe they traditionally think, oh, I don't like comics, so it's nice to right, have right. you know different styles. So, so our libraries, uh, did you guys wind up stocking a lot of anthologies like this? Yeah, we definitely do. Yeah. See, that's funny because in, in, in the traditional comics market, I'm talking yeah. about the di diamond yeah. market, uh, anthologies are considered to be kind of like a dead. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, they don't sell very well in comic okay. stores. But do these, do these circle? They okay? do, but I think it's because we have just a very high circulating collection and there's people that just want to read whatever mm -hmm. they can get their hands on. Well, see, I think that, oh, is that Daniel Klaus? It looks like Daniel Klaus. See, I think it is. It, it says is. in the bottom corner. Yep, it yep. is. So, yeah, there's another reason to get yep. this book, Daniel Klaus. Yeah, it's got a bunch um, of people. But, yeah, I find I find that, uh, you know, whenever I do talk with people. I can people, see that, though. I, I could see that that would well, be. Well, this is. Kind of like short story collections, sort of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They and, definitely struggle. And and adults who come to my comics uh, workshops, uh, either they're there to pick up their kids or they, they I also do, uh, well, tonight I got my uh, comics fundamentals class for adults. And I noticed that uh, the adults who, who attend library events tend to be more open-minded on what they want to read. Yeah, I you think that's, You know, they're, they're like, yeah. what, what should I read, you know? And and I tell them about a couple different things, and then they go out and get it, yeah. you know? So uh, it's not, you don't have that kind of uh, audience who's very invested in a franchise character yeah, as much. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. So that's worth noting, folks, too, for those of you who are developing anthologies. Now, I've got my book recommendations. I'm going to have to duck down to grab them. Now, these are books that should be in library collections if they're not uh, already. And first, I want to give a, a shout-out to my friend Krishna Sadasvan, who does a comic strip called PC Weenies. You talked about Garfield earlier. Okay. This is like, it's a, it's, it's a collection of comic strips, but this is more for uh, very nerdy teens and adults, and it's uh, tech humor. So uh. Krishna just posted a great comic strip today about uh, the new Mountain Lion update is coming out for okay. the Mac. And he shows, uh, you know, Bob Wiener, the main character of the strip, uh, updating Mountain Lion, and somebody saying, "No, you shouldn't do that. You should <laughs> wait for the for the, the version two to come out because the the first version always has a lot of bugs." He's like, "Oh, I, I do this with Reckless Abandon," and then the guy realizes he's <laughs> installing it on his computer, not Bob Wiener's <laughs> computer. So. Uh, it's really funny stuff. I love Krishna's art style. Uh, it's it's this very uh, iconic cartoony style with these really just graceful swooshing lines. So I actually this is one of the few comic strips I read for the art. Okay. <laughs> but it's also it's it's you know it's it's great for nerdy adults. Anybody who's a fan of uh, you know like the Twit podcasts, uh, Leo Laporte, or the Five by Five Network tech podcasts would definitely enjoy uh, Krishna Sadasvam's uh, collection, Rebutus Maximus, and you can get it at PCWeenies.com. Uh, librarians, any librarians? watching he's also awesome at doing uh, Skype visits at your library awesome. he, he was at that's KRC great. via Skype visit so that's just one thing to shout out in general yeah. if Skype changes everything even if you know in terms yeah. of getting people into your library quote unquote if you don't have someone local figure out how to Skype yeah yeah actually and that you know? is pretty pretty affordable yeah. I mean it's just uh, even like a I don't know if thin clients can do it but I mean yeah. like a, an old computer can Skype mm -hmm. 
So, okay, so that was a book recommendation for adults. I've got one that's for kids. Now, this guy's been on the show before, too, Mark Mariano. This is this is for, this. I would shelf in the youth area. It's called Happy Lou, and when you look at it, it's very much like Nick Jr. kind of style of artwork and adventures, and a lot of it happens uh, non-verbally, right? Uh, you, you have, uh, like, Owly with the word yeah. balloons with the, the symbol talking. But the neat thing that I love about this book, aside from Mark's art and storytelling, is he concludes each chapter with either, like, a family activity you can do. That's Awesome. based on the yeah. story or discussions you can have with your kids now I know I've told this story before but one of the one of the uh, great things that my dad did for me when I was a little kid and I think it helped steer me in the direction that I went is we would watch Saturday morning cartoons together we'd watch Plastic Man Super Friends and whatever and then he would talk with me about the show right. afterwards he'd be like oh man that, that bad guy in today's Plastic Man was kind of weird huh and he would engage me in a discussion so that I would retain mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, you know learn something from the storytelling and that's what Mark Mariano does in his books and yeah, I, I I just fell head over heels for this for the series once I saw that. That's awesome. So, so he's at mypalmark.com. The book is called Happy Lou. He also has a book called Flabbergast, which is equally good. But I would put Flabbergast a little bit higher in the age range because it has zombies and brain eating in it. But uh, Happy Lou definitely should be in every library youth collection. You won't be sorry. So, okay. Do we have any events that we wanted to promote? Anything uh, coming up at the Ann Arbor District Library? Um, well, we've got the Lego contest on Lego contest. Thursday, August 2nd, um, which is a week from Thursday. Where is that going to be this It's going to be at the Kensington Court Hotel, which is actually at Briarwood, right behind Sears. Oh, cool. That's a short drive. So copious amounts of parking. Ah, they yeah. They don't even fill up on game days, they told me, so... Really? Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That, is, that is actually yeah. boasting. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to boast, rather. Um, and then I, I believe in the coming weeks we have um, some comics or some Photoshop coloring comics workshops happening at the downtown branch on the third floor um, in the computer lab. I will post links to that in the show notes. That should be, I think, in three or four weeks from now at the time of this recording. But every year we do the Comic Book Academy and the Comics Fundamentals course, a six week course, which actually you can drop into if anybody's watching locally. Uh, you can drop in on any of the sessions you don't have to be there for session one to enjoy the whole thing um and then it concludes with a uh, class where you'll learn how to color comics in adobe photoshop elements which is a very inexpensive program that comes with most graphics tablets so that'll be uh towards the end of this month and then i, th- I think uh when it was the end of this month actually it'd be in mid-august um, yeah and then, and then I think in August, too, we have some more Skype visits with cartoonists, which I'll have to look up and put in the show notes as well. So, man, comic stuff is always yeah, happening Yeah, and we're, we're going, or we're playing our play.aadl.org game through August 31st. That's So true. that's why, that's longer for us. So this is a new year with programs lasting through the whole month, so it's great. Play.aadl.org, yes. You don't have to have a library card to play the game, and you can become obsessed very easily <laughs> with badges and game codes and all that. I was watching, uh, just before Kids Read Comics, when Eli did a badge drop of Kids Read Comics badges uh, and it's like you can reclaim you can claim so many uh, umpteen million points or yeah. whatever at Kid, Kids Read Comics uh, somebody c- commented and said oh that sucks because I gotta go to an event to get the yes. points and Eli says well yeah th- go to the event then and they're like but I'm in Hawaii uh-huh. <laughs> so it's like people are playing all over I the know, place I know and I, I love that we have kids bemoaning their Hawaiian vacation instead of coming to a comic <laughs> event so they can get points for our game it, it gives you an idea of yeah, how we've managed to uh, focus them in <laughs> so yeah that's the warning it is, it is addictive and Dave Carter is in the chat saying but you should get a library card anyway well of course you, you should. should you should but just in case your listeners are not here don't feel bad you can still still explain you know have fun with it so so okay well thank you everybody for in the chat for the great questions today thanks everybody who participated in the live streams as we tested out the google plus hangout and uh the uh the live stream simultaneously thanks to matt dubay for orchestrating the simulcast for this one we'll see if we can do this next week too uh oh lisa rollis is asking if any kids collected every krc code Uh, a few really oh oh, no no no. okay not for that master badge. Okay. Some people did get every single artist. Wow. I actually see? sat and helped a, a mom <laughs> make sure her list was complete because some of the folks said their their things out loud and so they didn't have them down. But there were a few that saw every single artist, but n- I don't think anyone got that ultimate badge. Yeah, we had the one crazy, ultimate badge. Like, you know, where if you attended everything at the event, you would get the ultimate badge. Oh, somebody's asking, what do the codes do? The codes can be redeemed for points, and the points can be redeemed for prizes yes. that are in the AADL shop. Yes, things like headphones and. 
beanie hats and teddy bears and bags and all kinds of good stuff. And this is something we'll have to earmark for uh, future discussion is how you you guys were so uh, gracious about into the summer game with Kids Read Comics yeah. to incentivize uh, participation well, in activities. Well, one there. thing to note is a lot of the really great quick draws and all of the illustrations are going into what we have calling our secret shop. So a lot of the KRC stuff that was created and made will be going into that shop. So that's another thing you can do with your points if you're wondering. Yep. See, so there you go, guys. So uh, another thing to uh, study, investigate, and, and uh, emulate at your local library <laughs> down the road. So, okay, well, um, this show will be available after the fact at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG60. This is our diamond jubilee, I guess. Oh. Wow. It's just Not quite as exciting <laughs> as the queens, but... You didn't wear a hat that looked like a cake. <laughs> I should have told you to. Uh, but but it also will be at comics.aadl.org, and then we will be streaming next w- or two Wednesdays from now on... Um, um, so it'll be uh, August 8th at 1230 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to have Kevin Coppa of the Puppet Benders return, and Gene Yang is going to be our Skype guest. We're going to awesome. do a wrap-up of the Legend of Korra uh, season. Uh, we're going to share our thoughts and responses. It's going to be Talking Korra Part 2. So if you haven't watched the whole uh, season yet, you better go do it. you got two weeks to do it. We'll be back on August 8th at com- comicsaregreat.tv and on the Google Plus Comics Are Great page, which I will link to in the show notes. So thank you, Aaron Helmer. Thank you. This was awesome. And thanks, everybody, for, for participating in the show today. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.